Are we live? Yes? Yes. Well, welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this second week of our Redeemer's Live, uh, live, our Redeemer's Lutheran service live from Facebook Live here in our living room. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. I, I hope you have grabbed a cup of coffee and you can sit back and enjoy uh, the service today. Uh, welcome to welcome to our living room. We have we have the normal crowd here. Alice and my wife, the camera, the camera person, Leo and Rosa. And um, I want to welcome all the our Redeemers, uh, our Redeemers Lutheran uh, guests or people who typically come to the church. But I also want to welcome all the people who are joining us just on Facebook here this morning. I got to tell you. Uh, I'm sorry we're a few minutes late getting started today. It's a scramble. For some reason, it's like 9.25 hits, and we have about 10 minutes worth of stuff left to do to get ready um, for the 9.30 service. It's, it's, it's kind of like when you're trying to get out the door to church, and it seems like no matter how hard you try and no matter how many years you go to church, it never happens that you get out the door smoothly and on time. So anyway, we're experiencing that here. Um, in trying to do these live services, but uh, but nonetheless, here we are started getting started, and I just I'm happy to be here to be able to do this. I'm thankful that this is something that technology allows us to do, and I'm just excited to share with you today what God has been putting on my heart. I'm excited for you to hear um, some of the things we've been working on for the service today, and. With that, though, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, today I'm just going to do a few announcements that we typically have um, before the service um, and that I want you to know about here. Uh, first of all, we do still have uh, planned to have service um, Palm Sunday, which is April 5th. Now, that's next week. Um, there's, a, there's a strong possibility that will be also Facebook Live. And we haven't made that determination yet as a church council, but we are going to be, um, I think, meeting this week to discuss further, um, further scheduling. So please keep that in mind for both Palm Sunday um, and then Easter as well. Uh, they, the Lent services, of course, we're not having those at the church during this period. But uh, those are some of the announcements, and there aren't any new ones as far as those go, but there are some prayer concerns I wanted just to mention. Uh, first of all, uh, please be pray praying for Jerry Lugodensky. Yesterday morning, um, he had had um, some things, some, some issues turn up in the night and then went to Jamestown and they flew him promptly then to Rochester to um, the Mayo Clinic. And he had had some internal bleeding. Uh, from what I heard this morning, um, that they have been able to stop the bleeding and he's stable. So we're, we're thankful for that. Happy to hear that. But please be praying for Jerry um, and for the whole Lugodensky family. Uh, one of the things that's most difficult right now, and, and, and this is something, this is sort of a, uh, an ancillary effect of, of this COVID-19 pandemic that we're in, is that no one was able to go with him to the hospital. No one was able to be with him when he was being transported. The whole hospital at Mayo was on lockdown, and it's the same from what I understand in most places. So even those even though it's a pandemic now, that doesn't turn off the reality that people still get sick, people still need health care. And even when that happens, they're, much, they're, they're, they're alone in it, much more so, because family and friends can't be with them. These hospitals are, are, are on lockdown. And so uh, that's, just a, that's something I want us to be just thinking about for the Luganetsky family and for anybody who's got loved ones that are in hospital that are sick. It's, it's an incredible additional layer of challenge. And so uh, let's be praying for, for anybody in those situations. Um, as well, I, I understand Pastor Eppen um, of the other Lutheran Church in Edgeley is, is still having some, um, some complications, serious complications. And so we'll be praying for him. Uh, the Our Redeemer's Lutheran Bulletin, uh, we're going to send to have posted on the website. And so if you want to read, if you want to then go and read through, you can read through other prayers, concerns, and individuals that we're praying for in your own, um, in your own prayers. You can keep those people in mind as well. So again, we'll have that posted on our website. Um, the other 
uh, the other, there aren't any other announcements. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask. Are there any announcements I missed or um, any prayer concerns? But that's just a habit. Um, I don't know if, if, if somebody wants to post something, I'll, I'll get to it and mention it. But uh, nonetheless, I, I won't be able to hear you. So we're just going to, we're going to go with, uh, with where we're at right now. Okay. Well, we are going to start this morning like we usually do. Last week we started, uh, it was a little bit different. This week we're going to do the order of confession and forgiveness. If you have a hymnal at home with you, um, uh, not that you would, I, we have like six of them here. I don't know how they keep piling up, but <laughs> Sarah says she knows. But we have about, we have, I have one here, and so you can just follow along. I know most of you have this, know this by heart. Um, but we're going to do the confession and forgiveness. And I'll just read both. I'll read both parts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires know <coughs> known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, we're going to have... Um, we're going to have a special reading, and this is a this is a reading. It's a it's a poem, and there's only one person in our house who I believe knows can read poetry as what. Uh, well, I know there's one person who wrote who reads poetry best in our house, and that's my wife. So, Sarah, would you come up and share this poem? Yes. Just went to. doing some camera adjustments again. Please hang with us here. I just realized I did last Okay. Does it look good? Awesome. Okay, this is a poem by Franciscan brother Richard Hendrick. Um, he posted it on Twitter last week. Home is called Lockdown. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But they say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and gray and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. They say that a hotel in the west of Ireland is offering free meals and delivery to the housebound. Today, a young woman I know is busy spreading flyers with her number throughout the neighborhood. 
so that elders may have someone to call on. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques, and temples are preparing to welcome and shelter the homeless, the sick, the weary. All over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are, to how little control we really have, to what really matters, to love. So we pray and we remember that yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate. Yes, there is isolation, but there does not have to be loneliness. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be a rebirth of love. Wake to the choices you make as to how to live now. Today, breathe, listen. Behind the factory noises of your panic, the birds are singing again. The sky is clearing. Spring is coming. And we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul. And though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. Okay, on that, on that final, thank you, Sarah. On that final word, sing, we're going to actually sing now. We're going to do a song. Um, this is going to be a bit of a, uh, a joint effort, a community effort here at, at, at the Gappa household. Alice is going to play piano. I'm going to play guitar. Sarah is going to take the lead part in singing. And I'm going to try to sing myself as well. So can we get set? And we have a... Uh, do you want to just turn that and then we'll... Mm, let's see. Mm. I think I'm going to have Leo do it. Come on, bud. All right, we got a cameraman, another cameraman here today to help. Okay, let's see. So you have to hold it this way. And you want to try, don't get that light in. You want to try and just get... Yeah, and me and whatever. Alright. Well, the song we're gonna sing is, is, is called I Have One Sit House. Oh, okay. Hey mom, I can't get you in the camera. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Just hold it up and go for it. Are you gonna stay? Are you gonna sing next to mom? Yeah. Awesome. We have a Look at the we have another singer too. Then, okay. Uh, so the song we're singing is is all in all, or you are my all in all, and <clears throat> we're gonna do our best. All right. <laughs> would it help if you scoot over a little bit, buddy? Then would you be able to see everybody better? Yeah. Okay, Alice, whenever you'd like to start.
Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us, for, to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, we'll have the readers come forward for today's readings. And in case you're wondering, I just think this is an important thing to share. In case you're wondering why we have a lectern at our house... <laughs> We got it at the school auction a couple years ago, and it, now it's like, it's so good we have one. Okay. Do you want me to get the chair for the kids? Does Rose want to stand on a chair? I was just going to move the left hand. Okay. Um, oh, but maybe for her to be higher, yeah. Okay, you can do All right, the first reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. And I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Here ends the first reading. Okay. I got a stand. Oh, thanks. <coughs> Can you bring it over here? Today's psalm is Psalm 112. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. 
If you, Lord, were to note what is done in this, O oh Lord, who can stand? For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be filled. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him, and his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than the watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O oh, Israel, wait for the Lord, for the Lord there is mercy with you. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Here I'm sitting. I'm sure we don't have mics, so. Okay, so you gotta, gotta say your words really loud, well, okay? The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 11, and Rose is going to help me with verses 6 through 8. For the mind that on the flesh is death, but the mind that on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Here ends the reading. The gospel reading today comes to us from the book of John, chapter 11. Uh, if you're familiar with the lectionary, the lectionary gets quite lengthy uh, during the, the, the Lenten uh, season, especially leading close to Easter. So, um, <clears throat> buckle in. <laughs> chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Mary, and her, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, "Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick." But when Jesus heard this, he said, "This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it." Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? <coughs> Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, our, Lord, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. Believe, but let us go to him. 
Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know whatever, that whatever you ask for God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore, <clears throat> when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Wow, what a story, what a, what a passage. First of all, thank you, uh, Alice, Rosa, and, and Leo, and Mom, all of you, or Rosa, Leo, and Mom, for reading. I love hearing children saying the words of Scripture, reading the words of Scripture. It is such a blessing. Uh, my message today, I'm going to be basing it on uh, the, the story from Ezekiel, uh, the story that Sarah read earlier. But I wanted to say a couple words. I, I sometimes do this. I kind of do a mini-sermon before the sermon. But I want to say a couple words about John, what I just read. Uh, because even as I read it, it just it, it just struck me. What we read in this particular passage, among other verses, among 45, 44 other verses, was uh, the shortest verse in the Bible. And that shortest verse in the Bible is chapter 11, verse 35, and it is that Jesus wept. Think about that. Think about the Son of God. Think about God himself weeping even though he knows what he's about to do. Even though he knows that Lazarus is going to live. 
Yeah, he weeps. He weeps in, 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 in solidarity in a way with the pain that um, is being felt by Mary and Martha and, 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 the, and the friends and loved ones of, of, of Lazarus. And I just think about that in the context of, of our world right now. And, and I read this morning a, a tweet by the Pope. I mean, who thought you'd ever say something like that? A tweet by the Pope. And, um, and he, uh, he spoke about this verse because a lot of people are reading this verse in the world today. And he spoke, of, he spoke about how that we might have the courage to weep. For a world that is struggling right now, uh, that is scared, um, uncertain, uh, for people who are losing loved ones to this terrible disease, uh, but that we might have the courage, as Jesus did, and I thought of that courage in a sense. Courage to weep. To let our hearts be broken. For a broken world. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so think about that. Just think about that. Again, that's, that's my mini-sermon. But I want to move on to the, uh, to the main sermon here. The title of my message today is When Your World Turns Upside Down. When Your World turns upside down. And, and I don't know, I, 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 this is heavy on my heart, so in a way, and I, and I, and I just, <clears throat> just want to warn you ahead of time, I hope, I, I hope I'm able to, to get through it. Um, but when your world turns upside down, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean when the rug gets pulled out from under you. I think for most of us, a lot of times in life, things can be going uh, stable. Uh, we're going on a particular course. We don't know the future, but, you know, more or less, we kind of know what tomorrow is generally going to be, and, you know, we make our calendars, we make our schedules. Life is stable. Things are going as they're supposed to go. When I say when your world gets turned upside down or when your world turns upside down, it's, it's when all of that, when that rug is pulled out, and everything that seemed knowable now seems mysterious. And everything that seemed stable now seems unstable. Everything that you were sure about, now you're uncertain about. In many ways, our world is in that space right now in a large sense. Um, two or three months ago, except for in the epicenter in China, most of the world was going about its business. Um, things were going as they were supposed to go. People were going to jobs and kids were going to school and people were celebrating the holidays, Christmas and New Year's. Everything was as it was supposed to be. And here we are. Now, all of that's different. The kids aren't going to school. There's not, uh, we're not going, many are not going to work. Uh, I haven't <laughs> filled gas in the car in like three weeks. The, I, I actually, I follow this, 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 thing on Twitter called Flight Radar, and it shows like little dots of flights throughout the world. And they were showing this graph from, uh, it, from January through March of all the flights, and at any given time there's like 175,000 flights, um, or 100, between 100 and 175, and, and then in the middle of March it just drops completely off a cliff. Planes are no longer flying. I mean, the world has changed. The rug has been pulled out from underneath the world, in a way, and we're all part of that. Personally, I'm sure that if you, you either have a story in your own life where the rug's been pulled out. And if you haven't had that story yet, if you don't have that story to tell, I think that story probably will come. I think it happens probably to everybody. It might be that it might be a relationship that is, is going well and you're expecting it to, to blossom into something more and all of a sudden it crumbles into nothing. And you wonder what happened. It might be that job that you're doing so well at and you're finally finding your groove and you're getting your promotion and you're, and you're feeling good. Your identity is strong. And all of a sudden, the boss calls you in and says, I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. 
Or it might be that, you know, everything's fine and then all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you feel a little bit off and you go into the doctor and a week later you come back and there's a diagnosis that something severe is going on in your body. And the rug gets pulled out from under you and you feel the instability and you feel the uncertainty. Um, many of you know my story in the recent past and and I just want to, I want to tell it a little bit for those of you who perhaps are, are listening and, and you don't know it. Um, I went to bed on uh, the night of October 1st, uh, as I typically do, and feeling like I normally felt, having just worked at, worked at the farm, a hard day's work at the farm. And... <clears throat> And everything was normal. I had the plans for the next day of what I was going to do. I kissed the, the kids goodnight, and, and we, Sarah and I visited a little bit and probably watched a television show or something. And then in the middle of the night at 3 in the morning, I woke up, and it felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me. At 3 in the morning, I woke up, and my heart was racing, and I couldn't breathe. And my legs were, were, were tingly and numb, and my tongue was numb. And I realized something really strange had happened. Something came about and pulled the rug out from under me. And I began to think about the day prior, and in the day prior I had been working inside of a grain bin with a with a, a paint chemical. And although we were wearing what we thought were, was the proper protection, for some reason my, my, my mask wasn't working and I breathed in that chemical. And it radically pulled the rug out from under me. And my life now for six months has been a, a process of, of wrestling with that new reality. That reality of a, that reality where I really both physically have not felt like myself for six months, um, but, but mentally, psychologically, emotionally wrestling with the stress, the anxiety. I mean, I, I could tell you so much, but I don't need to, other than to just be honest and say it's been so hard at times. It's been that feeling of my world being turned upside down. And, and I'm still in that. And I'm still fighting that right now. But you all probably have your own story like that. Something like that. And it can be a small way or it can be a big way. But in some way, we're all going to get to that point, I believe. Well, I want to turn here to Ezekiel. Because what we're looking at in Ezekiel today in chapter 37 is a world turned upside down for the nation of Israel, for Judah. What we're looking at in Ezekiel, it's the, it's the valley of dry bones, as you heard read earlier. It's these, it's these bones scattered across this valley that Ezekiel is led by the Spirit of God to go and prophesy to. But the context of what Ezekiel is prophesying to is he's prophesying to a, a, a nation of Israel, a time when the rug had been pulled out from under them. You see, just in 586 B.C., uh, Jerusalem, Judah, the southern kingdom of, of Israel, was attacked by the Babylonian Empire. And an entirely, entirely um, put in a state of shock. Everything they knew to be true in Israel, everything, Jerusalem, all the symbolic things of the, of the temple, of worship, and everything that, they, that God had, had, had made so sure in their life, the promises of God, all, everything seemed to be stripped away. And then even worse, they were taken into exile. And they were not even in their homeland. And everything was turned upside down. There's so much scripture throughout uh, the whole book of Lamentations is written from the standpoint of exile, the standpoint of, of the world, of the rug being pulled out. And this is what happens to this is what happens to Israel when they're attacked 
by, by Babylon, and Babylon takes them into a new place and destroys everything that's reliable, everything that's true. And then what we see is this valley of dry bones. The valley of dry bones, which, if, if you think about it, I mean, there's a lot of different... There's a lot of different ways we could describe these dry bones. A lot of different adjectives. But a couple things that I just want to think about is they're lifeless, they're powerless, and they're aimless. They're purposeless. They, they lack all of these major things that make life worth living, that make life able to be lived, to have life to have some kind of abilities, to have some kind of power, to have some kind of purpose. These are important things. And when you look at those dry bones, they're lacking all of that. But even more, if, you, if you're describing a place that's lifeless, a place that's powerless, a place that's blameless, sometimes it's the place you feel like you're at when the rug gets pulled out. It's the place the world might feel like it's at. The good news is, is that that's always a place that needs God. It's always a place that needs God. The life of God, the power of God, and the purposes of God. So what happens next? What happens when, for Israel, their world has been turned upside down? What happens for our 21st century world when the world has been turned upside, upside down? What happens for me when my world has been turned upside down, and for you, when your world has been turned upside down and the rug has been pulled out. I want us to dig into the scripture a little more to get that answer to that question. I'm going to read a little bit of Ezekiel 37, and I want you to listen for a word that comes up quite often. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. Again, he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you. I will put new sinews on you and make flesh grow back. I will cover you with skin and put breath in you though, so that you may become alive. So I prophesied, and as I was commanded, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And I looked, and behold, the flesh grew back, and there was breath in them. Then he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath. Thus says the God, Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on those that they may come to life. There was one word in there that I said, I think at least six times. And it was the word breath. It was the word breath. What happens next? What happens when, we're, when we feel like we are the bones in the valley of dry bones and that rug has been pulled out? I think we go back to the beginning. You see, this word breath, it's kind of a play on words here. Because right at the beginning of the, of the story, Ezekiel says, The Spirit of the Lord set me down, led me out and set me down. And then he talks about the breath. And it's the breath of God that is going to bring life. It's the breath of God that is going to bring these bones back to life. And the word breath and the word spirit in Hebrew are the same word. Ruach, breath, and spirit. But it gets better. I want you to go back to Genesis 1, chapter, chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. That word spirit, you guessed it, 
Ruach and the breath of God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, in the beginning when there was nothing, they call it ex nihilo, God created ex nihilo, God created something out of nothing. By his breath. His breath was the first thing there. The breath of God was the thing that started it all. And he spoke. And creation came forth. And of course we know the story of Adam and Eve and how he creates Adam and Eve and, and he breathes into them. The breath of God out of nothing. Do you feel sometimes, like when the rug is pulled out from under you, do you feel like you're nothing? Do you feel like you can't do anything? Do you feel lifeless and powerless and aimless? That is when the breath of God comes. That is when the breath of God comes. And just as he created in the beginning with his breath, and this is important, this, what he does in each of our lives is a sort of a recreation. It's a new creation. The breath of God. Isaiah, the, the, the prophet Isaiah, he says to, again in speaking to Israel, he says, Behold, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Whether, whether you're feeling like the rug has been pulled out from you and you're feeling like the valley of dry bones, or you're feeling like you're in a wilderness, or you're feeling like you're in a desert, the promises of God are the same. He wants to do something new. And it's in these places of weakness. It's in these places of brokenness where God really can do something new. And sometimes it's the only place. It's the only place that will actually let him in. 2 Corinthians connects this to the life and the person of Jesus Christ, which is true for all of us. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has become a follower of Christ, if anyone has put their trust in God through Jesus Christ and trusted in Him, he or she is what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When your world is turned upside down and the rug is pulled out, God can do something new. God has, has the power to, to create something out of nothing. He did it in the beginning, and he'll do it in our very own lives, each and every one of us. That I believe. And I say all this really in faith. In some ways, I feel strongest when I am when I'm speaking, when I am preaching about God's word. But many of my days, I struggle. I struggle since that happened six months ago in ways that, you know, are numerous. And it's, and so what I'm saying here, I'm not saying from like having got to the finish line or being on the mountaintop and speaking down and saying, yeah, it's going to be fine. No, I'm saying it, I'm saying it from faith in a way. Not in just a way, but I am saying it from faith. That God wants to do something new. That he is doing something new. That when we're broken, he is there to put us back together. Literally, as he says in Ezekiel, these bones came together. The sinews, the, the, the tendons, he, the skin. He puts it back together. That's what God does for us when we're broken. God's most amazing work I think starts with dry bones or in the wilderness or in the desert. And when we acknowledge this, that we, have, we, are, we are dead without Christ, as, as we heard in, in the scriptures today, that we are powerless without Christ, that we are aimless and purposeless without Jesus Christ, then we begin to find God goes to work in the deepest parts of who we are. One author I was reading this week calls this the soul, or I'm sorry, calls this soul work. Uh, Richard Rohr, um, who um, 
some of my family have, have been reading a lot and recommended, and I'm thankful for it. But he calls this soul work. It's this sort of second nature work, this thing that happens deep inside of us when we come to the end of our road. Jesus talks about this in several different places, but just a couple of examples. In Mark 8, 36, he says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but lose his soul? We spend our whole life trying to gain the world. We spend our whole life trying to, trying to, to get to a certain goal, to earn a certain amount of money, to have this, that, or the other, to make sure everything's just right, and we gain the world. But Jesus says, that's worth nothing if you lose your soul. Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. This isn't just about money and possessions. It's that Jesus is saying there is a life beyond life. There is a life that is deeper than the life that we just see on TV or that we see in our daily lives. Matthew 6.25 Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. And then again he says, is, is life not more than food? I mean, what's he talking about there? He's talking about this second order, this second order life. This understanding of the depths of God's grace and the, and the wideness of God's love that we only come to understand when we're broken. That we only come to understand when the world when the world we thought we had understood gets turned upside down. In many ways this is good news. This is This is hard stuff to learn. This is hard stuff to experience, but but the news couldn't be any better. It couldn't be any better that this is the very place that when life is the hardest, that God works the deepest on us. And I'll just say in conclusion today that I think we have an opportunity. That, I, that we have an opportunity as a world, and, and, and some of it has to do even with the poem that Sarah read earlier. But we have this opportunity as a world to reassess, to, to re-envision what life is really about. And that it is probably more than a booming stock market. Right? I mean, I use that as an example because it's, it's such a perfect example of how quickly things fall apart. But it's more than that. Whatever was booming in our life, and the rug got pulled out, life was probably about a whole lot more than that. And that's what we're coming to understand. And so, if it's the world at large, or if it's the church as a community, as the body of Christ around the world, or if it's our local churches, or if it's with our families, or if it's as individuals, whatever we're going through, it's my, it's my hope and my prayer that we see it as, as an opportunity to draw in closer to God, to the heart of God, to the love of God, to the transforming grace of God in each of our lives every day. Let's pray. God, we thank you today. We thank you that even when we feel like we're in a valley of dry bones, that you are there, that your spirit that your ruach, your breath, is there. That it is breathing new life into us all of the time. Lord God, I pray for, I pray for all of us as we navigate these challenging and difficult, stressful, worrisome, uncertain times. I pray, Father, that you would, that you would just breathe your breath into our lives, that your presence would become so real that we would grow in understanding of your love and understanding of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, so um, right now we're going to do, uh, I'm just going to read for us, and, and you, can, you can say along with me uh, the, the, the Nicene Creed as we uh, confess our faith, uh, the faith with which we believe together. And this um, Nicene Creed is a little bit, it's a little bit longer than the Apostles' Creed, but it's what we typically do during the Lenten season. <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. At this time, we're going to just spend, before we close here today, a few minutes in prayer, in prayer for uh, those who have asked us to be uh, prayer concerns here in the church, in prayer for our world, of course. And then I'll close with a benediction here. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we come to you today. We come before you and we worship you. We thank you for the coming of spring the new life that that represents. Each and every morning as the sun rises, we start to see green, leaves start to come out. We remember, Lord God, that you are always making things new. And so we pray, Lord God, for your whole people that as we, at times and in places, feel like dry bones, Lord, we pray your new life would come. That your new life would not only come and give us life, but it would shine through us into a world that is hurting right now in a world that is longing for truth, longing for love, longing for peace. Lord, help us as your church, your whole church, to reflect all of those things, because those are what you are. Help us to reflect those to the world. God, Lord, we pray now for the nations, uh, the uh, hundreds, over a hundred, 150, I'm not even sure how many nations now are dealing with this the coronavirus in ways that are putting challenges on healthcare systems, putting challenges on societies everywhere throughout this world, Lord God. We pray, Father, for a breakthrough, for a breakthrough in, in cures, a breakthrough in vaccines, a breakthrough in testing. Lord, give wisdom to the scientists. Lord, be present in all of these ways. We pray for the nations of this world that you would bring each nation through, that you would bring strength and guidance and healing. Lord, we pray for those in need today. And especially today I pray for Jerry Lugdensky and his in the and in, in him being now in the hospital in Mayo, being there alone because people aren't allowed in to visit him. God, I pray you would comfort him, that you would be present to him, that you would strengthen him, and Lord, that you would heal him. Bring him home so that he can again be home with Leanne with the family. 
We continue to pray, Lord God, also for just the many in our own, in, even in our state, that are suffering with or, or recovering from the coronavirus. We pray for your healing. Lord God, we, we thank you for, um, uh, for, for hearing these prayers. We also lift up to Pastor Eppen, who I mentioned earlier, who has been, who's been continuing to struggle as well with health concerns, heart-related. We pray, Father, that your, your blessing would be upon him and upon his church family. Lord, that you would guide them and guide him through this difficult time. And we lift up to you also the many we've been praying for in our church community. You know who they are. And you also know the needs and the prayer concerns that we each here who are listening, uh, we carry with us each and every day. That we don't share with others, but yet we know we carry the burden. God, you know what those are, and so we give those to you as well. We pray this, Lord, for all people, for according to their needs. Now into your hand, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Join with me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, would you receive this blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the service. Um, I pray you stay healthy, you stay well. I pray God's presence and power be with you. And please join us next week again. I believe it'll probably be here on Facebook Live at 9.30 a.m. Take care, everyone. Bye.